Good afternoon, Restoration 18th Century theater lovers and scholars, and welcome back to the R18 Collective's interview with the author series. The goal of the series is to highlight research in the field of restoration in 18th century theater and performance studies, and to provide a venue for scholars to share some thoughts and reflect on their recently published works. My name is Lisa Freeman, and it is with great pleasure that I'm here today to talk with Professor Maddie Burkert about her new book, Speculative Enterprise, Public Theaters and Financial Markets in London, 1688 to 1763 from University of Virginia Press. And I'll just show, show everyone that briefly. Professor Burkert is Assistant Professor of English at the University of Oregon. And in addition to being the author of Speculative Enterprise, she is also Project Director of the London Stage Database, which is funded by an NEH Office of the Digital Humanities grant and for which we are all very much in her debt. Notice I used a financial term. In addition to her new monograph, she's, all, she's the author of Essays Published in Theater Journal, Modern Philology and Digital Humanities Quarterly. Among her various projects in the field, field of digital humanities, she currently serves on the advisory board of David O'Shaughnessy's Theatronomics project funded by the European Research Council. And from 2017 to 2019, she served as co-chair of ASEX's Digital Humanities Caucus. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Berger here today to discuss her new book, Speculative Enterprise. We'll get started with some questions. Hi, Maddie. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be able to be part of this series. It's great to have you here. So we'll get started. I'll ask you a few questions and we'll see where the conversation goes today. So I just, uh, just to get us started, I was wondering if you could say a few words about what you take to be the main arguments of speculative enterprise, how you came to make those arguments and how you see yourself intervening in or contributing to the field. Sure. Um, so I think the primary insight of speculative enterprise is that I identify this theater finance nexus is what I call it, this kind of space of discourse that was created around the late 17th and into the early 18th century around the similarities and um, both material, actual, you know, financial um, parallels and connections between the theater and emergent financial markets, and also the kind of imaginative parallels, the ways that they could be thought together. Um, and so what I find is that people were talking about the new financial innovations, the birth of what we now think of in terms of things like the stock market as, um, as one and the same in many ways with the development of the way that the playhouses were being structured and the investment mechanisms that were enabling the playhouses, but also the kinds of publics that were being formed in these spaces. And they were both understood to be um, these spaces that perhaps had formerly been structured in ways that were more under the control of the crown and of the aristocracy. And there was a sense of these being spaces that might in some ways be more open now to a wider variety of folks, but also at the same time, spaces that were uniquely vulnerable in some ways to exploitation by um, the supposedly displaced sort of power brokers. And so um, I, I really got interested in how much these two spaces were being thought together and in some really surprising ways. And so in my book, I, I look at how that was playing out in plays being staged, but also in theater criticism, um, in prologues and epilogues and other kind of temporary performance pieces and, uh, and playbills and uh, newspaper advertisements for plays and, and sort of this whole big media environment um, and how it really is the case that this entire media environment is talking about the theater in terms of the financial market and financial markets in terms of the theaters. Well, great. No, I, and I, I love what I really loved was the way you were bringing together, right? Just both the, the sort of metaphorical, right, but also the very sort of material relationships, right? That that um, theater is a business, um, mm -hmm. and I thought I thought you just did such a nice job of, of moving and, and moving between those two different sort of aspects of the theater and 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 what you're calling the theater finance network. So um, that was really terrific to see. Um, you. And you know, a different aspect of that too is is really the public. So maybe you could talk just a little bit more about you just mentioned that sort of that media environment. So and and I do think right that um, 
And that's like one of the under understudied aspects of theater is the way that, um, or the way it gets set aside in all our conversations about the public um, and the emergence of the public sphere. So do you want to just say a little bit more about that? You hinted about that in your last answer. So I'll just give you another moment. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, right, there's the kind of classic narrative of the rise of the bourgeois public sphere where um, we have this idea that people were getting together in coffee houses and looking at the newspapers, right? Every, every newspaper was being sort of distributed around all the coffee houses in London and this idea that people got together read the newspaper over their cup of coffee, um, had a debate about politics, and that this is how the idea that um, ordinary people should hold the government accountable comes to be. That's the kind of classic narrative. And of course, this has been complicated and, and debated and like taken apart into a million pieces for a long time. But the, the part of it that I, I'm really interested in is how the, the theater as a space at the same time is also a space where certain kinds of publics are getting formed. Um, but it's a space where different kinds of publics can be formed. And in particular, um, coffee houses were overwhelmingly spaces accessible to men with money who were white and propertied and, um, and, and part of a particular social milieu. And there are certainly restrictions on how accessible the theaters are, but it's certainly a space much more accessible to women. Um, it's a space that seems to be more accessible to working people. Um, and it's a space where, um, as a result, the voices that can be part of these conversations about what it means to hold institutions accountable um, take on a different kind of uh, uh, heterogeneity, I guess. Yeah. And, and also, I think, a space where um, when Jürgen Habermas talks about the rise of the bourgeois public sphere in his very influential account, he talks about it kind of in this way where in the 20th century, when he's writing that, that this public sphere has kind of fallen because of the rise of mass media, of, of, telefo uh, telephone, of television um, and, and film, that there's now this kind of docile public that instead of you know, getting together and debating matters of public concern, people are just, you know, kind of sitting open mouths in front of their TVs. And uh, what I find is that, well, first of all, those similar kind of concerns about how docile does mass media render us, those are very much in the 18th century. Um, but also that, you know, just as Michael Warner has, has talked about in terms of his argument about counterpublics, that there is a way in which mass media can produce kind of um, resistant or um, or other, otherwise sort of um, counter publics, I find that that's also the case in the theater, that these supposedly kind of like um, mind numbing forms of mass media, in this case, 18th century theater, can actually create alternative spaces for new kinds of publics to emerge. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's precisely right. It's just thinking about when, when we, when we um, you know, evoke the public, it's like, who is that? Um, and I think your, your book is able to talk about what was a theatrical public and how it engaged with um, entertainment, with aesthetic forms, with politics. So um, really brilliantly done throughout the book. So um, yeah. the other thing I found really interesting was the way you um, organize the book, right? Which is, you know, you it's bookended by Kali Sibber in the chapter discussions, which is uh, part of the whole like Sibber revival, um, sure, yes. along with like folks like Elaine McGurr, um, mm -hmm. but also, right, the, the sort of fulcrum point, which I, you know, I was really inspired by at the center of the book is, is a, a long uh, discussion of sort of the, the works and career of Susanna Sontlieber. So I, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about those choices in the way, you know, whether you're, you know, how you're thinking about this as a kind of substantive transformation of the way that we sort of narrate the history of drama across this period. Well, it's a really generous question uh, because I really think that the aspects of the form that you're highlighting as innovative, I really owe a huge debt to a lot of people who are involved in R18. Um, you know, <laughs> so so first of all, I think that these were, Sibber and Saltlever in, in particular, you know, these figures who were kind of um, either ignored or actively maligned in 20th century criticism, right? And um, they were seen as these kind of political and artistic hacks. 
Um, but, you know, Jackie Bratton, you know, as early as, as 2000 and, and Misty Anderson in the, in the 90s were, were really doing a lot of work to recover Salt Lever's um, real significance in her time. Um, and in like your work and Christina Straub's work, we, we see a lot of um, work to, you know, create space to study these popular works from the perspective of cultural studies to take them seriously on their own terms. And so um, that was already all really happening. And then as far as Sibber goes, I, you know, I saw Julia Fawcett give a talk in like 2012 or something and was just like, who is this Kali Sipper guy and how can I get on that train? So, um, so, so I really feel like I'm, I'm very much standing on the shoulders of a huge amount of exciting energy around this work that's been building for, you know, 30 years at least. Um, so, so yes, I feel like I'm part of a conversation about what is all this stuff that's been actively sort of discarded as trash for like a century and that we're, we're just now starting to recognize like, oh, this actually has something interesting to tell us about the, the world in which it emerged. Um, and then in terms of, you know, the, the dismissal of people like Sibber or Salt Lever as, as political hacks and um, opportunists and whatever, I mean, I, I kind of think they're like the Lin-Manuel Mirandas of their time, right? Like he's doing Disney movies and like going to the White House and, and not really observing a distinction between Broadway and TV and, and Hollywood and politics. And I think in the same way, these were people who moved among different spheres and, and saw different ways of intervening in culture as all part of a bigger project. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that that's, that's, that's totally right. And it also, you know, part of, part of the work that you, you've done in this book also opens up these plays to considerations, right, of the, of the repertoire. We're, we're going to get to that question, of course, right, about the repertoire. Um, but, you know, it's just refreshing, you know, it's not the sort of standard account, you know, going from Congreve to, <laughs> to, to the Beggar's Opera to, you know, the, I, there are so many particular works that have been part of a conversation about economics, finance, and um, uh, theater in the period. So it was nice to see you bring forward um, these these other authors. Um, your your work also touches on the kind of rhetorics mobilized by moneyed interests. So this is another aspect of your book I was really um, interested in and curious about, and wanted to draw you out about about the ways in which you know there this sort of um, uh, goes back to that question of docility and passivity, right? The, the extent to which the middle class aspirations, desires are in some sense being capitalized upon by the elite power brokers. Um, and it seemed to me that that was like a, a, a kind of steady drumbeat throughout um, the, the work. And I, I was hoping you could sort of maybe say a little bit more about the ways in which you think this um, your work speaks to our present moment because that seemed implied, but it wasn't something that you you know explicitly articulated. So I thought I'd give you a chance to do that here today. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, when you're writing a a, a book that is self conscious about how events, uh, financial events that are cast in their own moment as being sort of once in a generation crisis, crisis but, they, but then they happen over and over again. So then you don't want to position your book as a response to a specific moment and fall into that same trap. But, I, but my book was very much coming out of this moment of the 2008 financial crisis um, and the sort of decade long like quasi recovery that we then experienced. And, and also, you know, I was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison during a period of significant sort of political and economic people there and a lot of questions about labor unions about the relationship between um you know public universities and government entities and that was all i think really happening at, at kind of the same time as occupy wall street was happening and and so that really i think set the stage in my mind for these interests in how much space there is actually for people even people acting collectively to intervene at all in the kind of cycle of endless crisis that is the sustaining myth of capitalism. That's the sustaining myth is that this crisis is the last one and the only one. And of course, you know, after 2008 and having so many conversations with people in, you know, maybe 2015, 2016 of like, well, at least we finally got out of that and nothing really bad will ever happen again. And, and like, 
then COVID happens and worse things happen to the economy. Like it's, it's endless. And yeah. so I think that that really, for me, was the inspiration. And that I saw when I encountered plays like Sibber's The Refusal, I saw them as the kind of, not even like the big short of their day, because the big short is actually about like the people juking the financial markets, but more like The Other Guys, which is also directed by Adam McKay, but is his like Will Ferrell slapstick comedy from roughly the same era, where where the financial malfeasance is, it's the same stuff. It's It's all the um, mortgage-backed security stuff that was happening at that time yeah, right. but it's like the background right and then these guys have like a buddy cop moment and the background is all this financial malfeasance yeah. um, where the bad guys are the people manipulating uh the the housing markets for gain but then but then if you've seen the other guys the closing credits are then these like elaborate and intricate infographics about the the housing crisis and how it was related to the um, subprime mortgage uh, boom and bust and and then you know subsequently the things like Lehman Brothers collapsing so I really I I mean I I saw I saw that film in theaters and again around the same time of like Occupy Wall Street and whatever and I remember the audience uh, in the theater just like collectively like gasping and hooting and booing and like this very kind of cathartic moment around these infographics um and I and I just recognized that when I started yeah. to read plays like The Refusal wow that that's really powerful and I'm gonna now now I know what I'm gonna watch over my winter break I've got to go watch the other guys um you know I've watched I've seen play Enron I've seen the the Lehman trilogy um and I've seen the big short so now now I'm gonna go watch the other guys and and so like if you want if you were to talk about or if you were to think about which play that you write about in your book then you would want to see um put on the stage as part of the 21st century repertory um, to maybe perhaps bring some of the issues you just talked about forward. Um, which which play would you choose? Which one would you like to see produced? Mm, well, I think, can I, can I, can I say two? Yeah, you could say two. You can say two. Absolutely. <laughs> for completely different to some days. <laughs> uh, just for completely different reasons. To bring the issues forth that I just talked about, I do think Sibber's the refusal um, because it it would take some work to get the economic dimensions of it to really work for an audience today. But it is this kind of like Wolf of Wall Street moment at the end where this whole play has followed this director for the South Sea Company and he's going around basically falsifying these lists of investors to inflate the value of the company's stock. And he kind of falls into his own trap where he's promised somebody that they could marry his daughter if the stock in the company got like astronomically high, far beyond what he thought was possible, but then of course it does. And he's like almost sort of enabled this condition to occur. Um, and then and then he's, you know, it, then it's up to his daughter to kind of get out of it, right? And that's the, that's the kind of action of the play. And her right of refusal, the word refusal, the right to, you know, you don't get to pick who you marry, but you can say no is also the term for the financial instrument that is being sort of at, at stake in her dowry, right? So it's like, it, take, it would take some work to get that part of it translated, but then it's this amazing thing where after the whole marriage plot has concluded and it's been incredibly sort of formulaic in a lot of ways, everybody's sort of ended up exactly how you knew they would as soon as you met them. But at the end, there's just this moment where the guy's like, now that everybody's married and you're in the family, I gotta tell you, sell sell, sell as fast as you can. And that's like, that's it. That's it. Close curtain. That's the end of the play. So that's an just amazing right. moment that would really work if, if we could figure out how to like explain the, the dynamics for yeah. folks today. Um, and then I, I really think Salt Lieber's Gamester because a lot of her works have been like the Bassett, the Folger did the Bassett table and people have really been interested in that for the figure of the woman scientist. Um, you know, uh, Misty's put on the busy body, right? And that's been like a very um, sort of successful example of bringing forth Salt Lever's work today. Um, but I think uh, her play, The Gamester, is is great because it's got these really sort of like fast paced gambling scenes that I think could really work as a kind of, I mean, we, we still have that, the kind of like exciting gambling scene that's still a convention that's with us. And I feel like 
there is a way also in which it's really in conversation with Afrobend's The Rover, which is a play that's well known from this period. And so to see someone a generation later um, and at a moment when Ben's legacy is really important to being a woman writer, but also has to be kind of put away in certain ways because of the changing sexual mores of the time, to see someone kind of reworking aspects of the rover, um, I feel like there's something that could be really interesting for folks today who are familiar with the rover as one of only a handful of restoration plays routinely staged to then see what happens about a generation later to respond to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, those are two great suggestions. And so we're going to keep those in mind. And when you talked about the refusal, I was thinking, oh, we could put up some of those infographics um, to try to explain it. I immediately had like a vision of like the infographics alongside the performance to bring out some of the issues. So so maybe there's a way, Maddie, maybe there's a way to do the refusal. So um, or just so translate it to meme stocks, right? <laughs> he could exactly. just be selling meme stocks or like NFTs. Exactly. The See, same people thing. will totally get it. It's all the same <laughs> thing. It's all the same thing. Um, and I love the way that your book really brings that out, right? It brings that out. Um, so we're at, at almost at the end of our time. So I just want to ask you, like, what are you working on now? What's next for you? Uh, where are things headed? Yeah, I've got a couple of articles that I'm revising right now. Um, one is, uh, they, they do come pretty directly out of the book, as well as my database project in a lot of ways. So I've got one about these figures, um, nobody and somebody who were kind of stock figures all the way up from, you know, they're alluded to in Shakespeare. So we know that they're sort of these pan-European characters. Um, there's, there's a Mickey Mouse cartoon with them. So they're still kind of with us. Um, but I, I'm doing an article about where they come up in the 18th century and how they become these figures of sort of um, economic precarity and protest. And I've got one about um, the, some of the kind of interesting copyright negotiations that Salt Lever was involved in and drawing some connections to the invisible labor of technology work today and kind of ghost work economy of technology and the specifically the women who were based in Hong Kong who transcribed the London stage records that then subsequently became the, the 1970s electronic copy of the London Stage reference books, which then have become my database. And so there's this history of sort of underpaid and unacknowledged labor underneath all of that. So those are two articles I'm revising. And then I've got some funding, you know, COVID willing next summer to go uh, to the National Archives in Kew um, to follow up on some research I started a few years ago on the women who uh, held shares in the playhouses around the turn of the 18th Perfect. century and the network of, of shareholders in those yeah um, endeavors yeah well that, that 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 sounds terrific so um we will look forward to more from maddie burkard and um i'll look forward to seeing you hopefully in baltimore who knows uh <laughs> covid surge be damned yeah. um uh but if not i'll look forward to seeing you virtually uh in in future and to to hearing and reading more of your work and i i really want to thank you for joining me today it's um really terrific book and I hope lots of people read it and um, you know I'll, I'll look forward to hearing more as as things develop for you so thank you uh, thank you it's great to really, see you really a pleasure to talk to you about this